working into the late hours of the night, preparing for an imminent court appearance the following morning. I found myself startled by the sudden waft of a long-forgotten, yet distinctly familiar aroma. The essence of desert air, a ghostly scent, inexplicably manifesting itself in the heart of Boston, a world apart from the arid landscapes of my homeland. The intrusion of this particular scent evoked a potent and unsettling memory. During my college years, I encountered a profoundly unsettling incident. At the age of 24, financially strapped and navigating life behind the wheel of a time-worn car, previously owned by a succession of predecessors, I remained rooted in my parents' home, a sanctuary of familial warmth and comfort. Despite my father's jests about repurposing my bedroom, the perks of home-cooked meals and free laundry services were unmatched. To this day, nothing compares to the comforting embrace of my mother's homemade macaroni and cheese. Academically inclined and driven by a passion for social justice, I pursued a degree in social work with a specialization in child advocacy, a path my mother often asserted I was destined to tread. The incident unfolded during one of my journeys back home from college, a three-hour drive punctuated by an extensive stretch of desert highway. This desolate road, particularly unsettling after nightfall, compelled me to hasten my passage through its expanse before the sun dipped below the horizon, plunging the surroundings into an abyss of darkness. The landscape offered little diversion. Sporadic shrubbery lining the roadside, sand dancing across the asphalt, stirred by elusive gusts of wind, and sporadic vehicles traversing the lonely thoroughfare. With the windows rolled down, allowing the fragrant desert breeze to infiltrate the cabin, I would detect the distinctive scents of creosote and desert sage, signaling my proximity to home. Often, I drowned out the monotony with blaring radio tunes. On that particular afternoon, delayed by unforeseen circumstances, I found myself traversing the desert as the sun began its descent casting elongated shadows over the rugged terrain. Engrossed in my work within the confines of my office, the phantom scent transported me back in time, enveloping me in a cascade of memories. Spotting her from a distance of about a mile, I observed the solitary figure traversing the endless expanse of the desert road. Amidst the monotonous landscape, she stood out like a lone beacon, a stark incongruity against the barren backdrop. Instinctively, I recognized her as female and surmised that her presence in such remote surroundings bespoke an underlying distress. Without hesitation, I resolved to offer assistance, a testament to my innate sense of decency and compassion. Drawing nearer, I spotted the backpack, her lengthy, golden locks cascading over it like a decorative fringe. Her ponytail, a sleek accent, added to her allure from behind. Anticipation surged within me. I yearned to glimpse her countenance. What if I stumbled upon a picturesque encounter, rescuing a distressed maiden on this desolate highway? With a flick, I silenced the radio and found myself humming the melodies of Hotel California. Bringing my vehicle to a halt just ahead of her, I awaited her approach, ensuring my hands remained conspicuously on the wheel. As twilight enveloped the landscape, Casting a dim, purplish hue upon the surroundings, I hesitated to step out of the car. The remote setting, coupled with the encroaching darkness and elongated shadows, bore an uncanny resemblance to the backdrop of a clickhead thriller. True to expectation, she approached, passing by my car as if it were a mere bystander in her journey. Her pace remained steady, her boots tracing a path away from the road. Unable to contain my curiosity any longer, I emerged from the vehicle. Hey, I called out. Are you all right? Pausing momentarily, she turned, her expression tinged with bewilderment. Yeah, why do you ask? Oh, I just thought you might need assistance. Perhaps a ride, I offered. Thanks, but I'm fine, she replied, her ponytail swaying as she resumed her stride. I stood rooted to the spot, feeling somewhat foolish as she receded into the distance. The desert expanse stretched out before me, its nocturnal ambience shrouded in darkness and a biting chill. Despite her apparent composure, the notion of leaving her stranded unsettled me.
Fueled by concern, I hastened my pace to catch up with her. You again, she queried, casting a fleeting glance in my direction without turning her head, her stride unbroken. I suppose so, I replied. What brings you here? She inquired. Just thought you might require some assistance. Nightfall is swiftly approaching, and the desert can be rather unforgiving after dark. The nearest town is a good 60 miles away. Are you certain you don't need a lift? I assure you, I'm not some dubious character, I explained. I assure you, she retorted, mimicking my tone. I'm perfectly fine. If you insist, I conceded, a hint of uncertainty tainting my words. I do. Farewell. She dismissed me crisply, continuing on her path. Glancing back at my car, I noted its distance, farther than anticipated. Had we truly ventured that far? Shrugging, I hastened, slightly faster than before, toward my vehicle. She possessed a certain charm, albeit not of the breathtaking variety. There was a toughness about her, an air of resilience forged through adversity. Perhaps life hadn't been kind to her. Seated behind the wheel, I deliberated for a few moments. Should I leave her stranded? Should I trail behind her? While she would undoubtedly detect my presence, it would reassure me knowing she was safe. Yet, traversing another 60 miles to the next settlement, even at her brisk pace, seemed interminable. The desert, veiled in nocturnal hues, exuded an unsettling aura. Should I take her at her word and proceed? As I observed, the encroaching shadows enveloped her figure, gradually diminishing its visibility until she faded into obscurity. With the sun casting its final glow upon the distant hills, darkness claimed dominion over the landscape. A shiver coursed down my spine. Not fear, per se. I'd traversed this highway countless times. But that sensation, it left me feeling slightly disconcerted, you know. Encountering a self-assured, resolute blonde traversing the desert road was hardly an everyday occurrence. Opting to leave her be, I redirected my focus homeward. Yet, as my vehicle lurched forward, I scanned the road, anticipating her emergence in the headlights glow. I drove an antiquated Chevrolet, unattractive yet reliable. One headlight pointed steadfastly ahead, while the other cast its beam to the roadside. Familiar with its eccentricities, I found myself growing increasingly apprehensive as minutes passed without a sign of her. She couldn't have distanced herself that greatly, not yet. Another five minutes elapsed, and still, she remained elusive. That inner voice, the one that whispers wisdom into your consciousness, trust me, it often speaks with sound advice. I ought to have heeded it that fateful night. I tried to convince myself she had merely deviated from the road to set up camp. Maybe I had overlooked her in the dim glow of my headlights. Perhaps she had shifted to the other side of the road for better visibility. I concocted myriad explanations, attempting to dissuade myself from retracing my path to check on her. Yet, I yielded. Amidst the desolate desert, beneath the cloak of night, I maneuvered my decrepit vehicle, executing a precarious U-turn. Defying the relentless admonitions of that persistent inner voice, I embarked on the journey back, scouring the landscape for the solitary blonde wanderer. Despite my outward resolve, internally, I grappled with uncertainty. After traversing the desolate expanse for what felt like an eternity, my fears materialized. She was nowhere to be found. Curses echoed in my mind as I contemplated my next course of action. Why did I feel compelled to intervene? Why shoulder the burden of responsibility? I was but a commonplace 24-year-old, burdened with my own concerns. Yet the prospect of abandoning her to an uncertain fate gnawed at my conscience. What if I returned home, seeking solace in the comfort of my bed, only to awaken to the grim tidings of a life lost in the desert? With a decisive swerve, I redirected my vehicle homeward. Though the path ahead remained fraught with uncertainty, the mere act of retracing my steps offered a semblance of reassurance. Halting the car, I retrieved my cell phone from the passenger seat, its signal absent amidst the desert's expanse. Nevertheless, its illumination, akin to a beacon of hope, served as a guiding light as I ventured towards the trunk. 
Enveloped by the cloak of night, darkness veiled me like a shroud. Yet unlike the warmth of a comforting blanket, this darkness offered no solace. Delving into the contents of my trunk, I retrieved a colossal, luminous floodlight ensconced in vibrant yellow hues, accompanied by two triangular emergency reflectors. Activating the floodlight, I stashed my cell phone in my rear pocket after extinguishing its feeble flashlight, ensuring its role in guiding me through the shadows. With a resounding thud, I closed the trunk and positioned the reflectors behind my vehicle, a precautionary measure against potential collisions in the desolate expanse. In my endeavor, I sought to uphold a sense of responsibility amidst the eerie stillness of the night. With a decisive motion, I directed the floodlight towards the vast expanse of desert to my right, methodically scanning the landscape. Yet beyond the sporadic clusters of shrubs and rocky outcrops, there lay a barren, desolate terrain devoid of significant features. The monotonous landscape stretched before me, punctuated only by occasional sightings of stoic cacti. Resolute, I shifted my focus to the left side of the road, diligently scouring the darkness for any trace of the elusive wanderer, yet my efforts yielded no fruitful results. Frustration simmered within as I retraced my steps to the right side of the road, contemplating my next move. Stepping onto the rocky desert sand with a heavy heart, I offered a silent prayer for guidance, hoping for a swift resolution to my quest. With each sweep of the floodlight, I maintained a vigilant watch, attuned to the tranquil symphony of the desert night. Tenacious in my pursuit, I pressed forward, navigating the desolate landscape with unwavering resolve. As the minutes elapsed, a sense of despondency crept over me, urging a reconsideration of my course. Deciding to chart a wide arc back to my vehicle, I resigned myself to the possibility of an unfruitful search. Yet, amidst the bleak expanse, a peculiar sight caught my attention, an incongruous silhouette amidst the featureless terrain. Focused on the distant shape, I embarked on a determined stride towards it, a glimmer of hope igniting within me. With each advancing step, the contours of a sleeping bag emerged from the darkness, accompanied by a cascade of blonde locks, offering a beacon of hope amidst the desolation. Hey, I called too loudly in the dead quiet. There was no response. I found it hard to believe she could have fallen asleep already. Hey, blonde chick. I called again. I actually said it that way because I knew it might make her respond to me. Girls really don't like to be called chick. I expected her to respond with her name, at least. Nothing. No sound. Finally, I was within easy reach, and what I saw had my heart beating right out of my chest. The girl was there, on top of the sleeping bag, her blonde head propped up on her backpack. At first I thought she really was asleep, or at least faking it. She had her hands laced together on her stomach. But when I got right up close, I could see I was totally wrong. Her face was gone. In its place was only a sticky skull, skin eyes, muscle, and sinew having been eaten away by desert creatures, her blonde hair still mostly attached. The effect was horrifying. Her clothes, she was on top of the sleeping bag, not tucked into it, were dirty and torn. I could see where carrion creatures had eaten holes in her body. I could see her right femur. I couldn't look away. I was simultaneously terrified out of my mind and morbidly curious. But finally, I noticed the blood, long since dried, that had pooled in copious amounts underneath her. A giant dark stain on her sleeping bag. The handle of a large hunting knife sticking straight up out of her chest, just under her sternum. Realizing the truth, and suddenly feeling like a coward, my gorge rising, I ran, booked it back to my car as fast as I could go. I was so grateful for that giant floodlight. I would never have found my car again without it. I think I drove the last 60 miles to town in about 20 minutes. My first stop was at the police station to report what I'd seen. It was only as the story was coming out of my mouth did I understand what I'd really seen. The girl I'd talked to on the side of the road. The one I worried about enough that I went searching for her. She was the ghost of the body I'd found, covered in blood, in the desert. 
The officer I'd been talking to watched me carefully, understanding in a second what I'd only just understood myself. As daylight came, man, that was the longest night of my life. I was in the back of a police car headed out the desert road once again. I had tried to explain to them that I would never be able to find the exact location again. Everything looked the same, but they insisted I go along. After a while, the officer who was driving said to his partner, Look Mick, look there. He was pointing at something ahead and off to the left a bit. I craned my neck to see what they saw. They were looking at two triangular emergency reflectors and some serious skid marks on the asphalt. I still had the newspaper article somewhere. Jess Norris, runaway, aged 18, missing for nearly a year, finally discovered in the middle of the desert. Though there wasn't much to go on, time and elements having washed away any real evidence, it was surmised she'd hitched a ride and was murdered by whomever picked her up. Her parents, at least, had been glad to finally have some closure. What the newspaper article never mentioned, however, was the means by which she had been found. The officers and the staff writer for the newspaper had both decided it was better to leave out the part about her ghost. She still haunts me. I still see her face, so world-wise and weary, as she spoke to me when I'd offered her a ride. I prefer to remember her like that, instead of the nightmarish skeleton she'd become when I finally found her. Years later, Mom will sometimes call me to report another sighting. Jessie is still hiking that long stretch of desert road.